in the, the 1950s, a research project was conducted to investigate the effects of certain narcotics and how addictive they can be. And so they took some rats and they put them in cages and they gave them access to drugs and they found what they suspected is that these rats, once they tasted the drugs, they kept wanting to go back. And very quickly, they became addicted to these drugs. And all of a sudden, we as a society began to understand just how powerfully addictive and dangerous some drugs could be. And that's true. But in the 70s, there was a, another psychologist, Bruce Alexander, who started to question if that's the whole story. If there's a little bit more to the, the power of addiction, because the truth is not everybody tastes a drug and immediately gets addicted. I mean, you think of the opioid crisis today, which is just, damn it, it's ruining lives across this country. But, but I personally have been prescribed opiates in my life, and I didn't get addicted. I imagine many of you were prescribed opiates in your life, and you didn't get it addicted right away. And so Bruce Alexander, he started to suspect, you know, all these rats, when they did it in the first uh, study, they were all in, in cages, in isolation. So he decided to do his own study, and he, he replicated their study. He had some rats in cages in isolation, but then he created a rat park. And the, the study is known as the Rat Park Study. And he took all of these rats and he created this society, this community of rats where they all got to hang out together. And he gave them both equal access to the drugs. And they found that the rats in isolation went back to the drugs almost 20 times more than the rats in community. Human beings aren't rats. <laughs> I get that. But isolation Isolation can be just as devastating to human beings as it can be to rats, even, even more so. Psychology Today, they say feelings of isolation can have serious detrimental effect on, one, on one's mental and physical health. Loneliness can be a contributing factor to heart disease, type 2 diabetes, arthritis, among other critical diseases. Lonely people are also twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease, at the root, isolation compromises immunity, increases the production of stress hormones, is harmful to sleep, and impacts cognitive abilities. All of this feeds chronic inflammation, which lowers immunity to the degree that lonely people even suffer more from the common cold. Loneliness can be a chronic stress condition that ages the body and causes great damage to overall well-being. You see how devastating isolation and loneliness can be to the human condition. And, and conversely, we also see the power of community to bring hope and healing. In that same rat park study, they took some of the rats that were in isolation. Some of these rats were there in isolation for two months, heavily addicted to the drug for almost two months, and they, it, they put them into the rat park. And very quickly, those rats who had been isolated and had been addicted started to pull away and, and choose not to go back to the drug. And they actually voluntarily underwent withdrawal of their own accord. Because community has a power to bring healing. And again, human beings aren't rats. But for us as well, community has a power to heal. And not just a, a power to uh, help us prevent the dangers of isolation, but also to bring healing where we've already experienced brokenness. And we come to the end of our series, Uncomfortable, where we've been talking about the awkward and, and challenging aspects of Christian community, but also understanding that it's, it's essential, right? And, and yes, community, it is uncomfortable, and it is awkward, and it is challenging at times, but it is also essential to the human condition. And I, I'm hoping that now, eight weeks into the series, you guys are on board with that. Like, you don't need us to, again, convince you of the importance of com community. Even if you haven't gotten to the place where you're, like, taking next steps to in, uh, invest in your own community, I, I hope that you at least are to that place where you understand this is important. Because human beings weren't meant to be alone. In fact, this was the very first thing God said about human beings. I don't know if you know this, but when God was creating everything, he created, every time he created something, he looked at it and he said, oh, that's good. He, said, he looks at it and he says it's good. He creates the next thing. He looks at it and he says it's good. He creates Adam, right? He creates man, and he looks at it and he says, that's not good, right? Ladies, don't get too excited, all right? It's not, he's not just saying there's something defective about Adam. I know you'd beg to differ, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, 
But God looks at Adam, he says, it's not good for humanity, for human beings to be alone. It's not good for us to live in isolation. So he creates Eve as a companion. And this isn't about singleness. Uh, You know, some people misconstrue that, like God is saying, it's not good for us to be single. That is not true. Jesus was single, like fully human being, most fully human being ever single. Uh, the apostle Paul was single. He wasn't only single, but he, he wished every Christian could be single because he saw the merits of singleness. So don't mis, uh, misinterpret this to mean that God is saying anything against singleness. Singleness is great uh, if God is calling you to that, but isolation is not. And what psychologists today are recognizing, the, the just detrimental damage that can happen in isolation is the very first thing God observed about human beings. It's not good for us to be alone. And I hope you believe that for yourself. But today, as we close out this series, as we come to the end, I'm I'm hoping that we could take this idea of community and how valuable it is and start to think not just for ourselves, but thinking beyond ourselves. Because if community is good for you, then community is good from you. Right? If, it, if it's good for you to pursue and seek community for yourself, then it's also good for you to bring community to people who need it. Because there are a lot of lonely people in this world. There are a lot of people living in isolation, and it's not because they want to be there. It's because they have no access to community in the ways that some of us do. And so today, I, uh, I want to invite you to open up to Luke chapter 14, because we're going to look at a teaching of Jesus that addresses this very issue, and it's probably one of the most direct teachings Jesus ever gives. There's no parables. There's no, like, hidden pretext or anything. He's just very straightforward about what he's going to say here. Uh, And in this passage— Just to give you a little bit of context, Jesus has been invited to a a dinner party or a lunch by a Pharisee, right? And if you're not familiar with who the Pharisees are, they were the religious leaders in Jesus' day, these religious elites. And they were very devout, but they were also a little bit legalistic and oftentimes hypocritical. And this was not just a Pharisee, not just any Pharisee. This was a prominent Pharisee, invites Jesus to his house, and it says that they were watching him closely, Not because they were hoping to learn something from Jesus. They were hoping to see Jesus mess up. They wanted to call him out. They were hoping to see some flaw in his armor, right? And and so they invite him over, and they're watching him. And Jesus heals a sky on the Sabbath, which was like a no-no in their day. And so they're already kind of a little like, oh, what's Jesus going to do? And then Jesus kind of challenges them, tells them to pursue humility. And then Jesus turns to the host, the guy who actually invited him to dinner. And this is what he says. In verse 12, then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they might invite you back and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. I love Jesus because uh, for a lot of reasons, but, but sometimes Jesus is such a punk, but like in, in exactly the right ways, because he's at a lunch uh, or dinner party, and he turns to the host and tells him how to host a dinner party or a lunch. It's like, uh, you know, just so you know, if, uh, hypothetically speaking, if you ever have people over for lunch or dinner, I don't know if you do that sort of thing, uh, <laughs> but he, he turns to his host and he says, you're doing it wrong looking around the table, and he's seeing the, the, the people that are there with him. And Jesus says, no, don't, don't invite these people. Don't invite your friends and your family and your relatives and your rich neighbors, right? And, and all the people that Jesus kind of says don't invite, there's kind of four, four categories that he points out. The first is he says, don't invite your friends. Your friends are the people that you like, that also like you, and they also like the things that you like, right? The, the friends are the easiest people in the world to hang out with because— there's, there's just so much mutual liking that's going on. He says, don't invite your friends. He says, don't invite your family, right? He says, don't, don't invite your brothers and sisters. And this is kind of your, your immediate family, the people that you have the most history with. Even if you don't always get along, there's just a comfort there because it's your family, right? And then he says, don't invite your relatives or, or we'll say your people. 
Now, I, I know for some of you, your extended family, those are your people. Like some of you today are going to go to like Sunday lunch with your extended family, and you do that every single Sunday, and you do not miss family dinner. Like this, your extended family is your people. Most of us white people, we don't have that. That's not like a, a thing that we do, which is, I, I envy you for that. But uh, for, for others, your, fa- your, your people might not necessarily be your extended family. For some of you, it might actually be your small group. I, I know, actually for me probably, my small group, my beacon small group, it, they're my people, right? And Jesus says, don't even invite them. Don't, don't invite your people. Number four, he says, don't invite your benefactors. These are, you know, he says, don't invite your, your rich neighbors, the, the people that you can kind of gain something from. Uh, a few years ago, uh, it was about a year and a half ago, Lindsay and I were in Brooklyn. She had just finished running the half marathon with World Vision, and we decided to grab brunch while we were still in town. And uh, we did what every good millennial would do. We go on our phones, and we yelp, like, the best place to grab brunch in the area. And we pick a place, and we get there, and the line is like, out the door on the sidewalk, and we're like, what is going on? And it turns out they were giving away free brunch, which is exactly what I wanted to spend on brunch. So uh, we park, and we get online. We're like, it's worth the wait. I don't care if you just ran 13 miles. You could stand in line. (laughs) And we're waiting, we're waiting. We were there for probably like 10 or 15 minutes, and all of a sudden, they call for a party of four. They're like, is there any any parties of four? And everybody's just kind of looking around. Apparently, it was like Noah's Ark, and everybody was there two by two. And so there were no parties of four. And so Lindsay and I turned to the, the couple of guys in front of us, and we're like, hey, do you guys want to just share a table? We'll like grab, brunch. we'll be a foursome, because let's be honest, you're going to go inside, and the tables are only going to be this far apart anyway. So might as well share a table. So we go in. Uh, we get in a little early. I'm excited about that. Brunch is free. I'm excited about that. Uh, but we're still doing we're still doing our individual brunches. Like it's me and Lindsay, and then it's Sean and Joe. Like they're they're here, and uh, we're we're eating. And all of a sudden, I, I see them grab their mimosas and clink their glasses and say, "Cheers to Broadway." I said, "That's interesting. What are you guys celebrating?" Turns out, Sean, the day before, uh, he was cast in this show. I don't know if you heard of it. It's called Hamilton uh, on, <laughs> on Broadway. Uh, all of a sudden, brunch, it, this became an us. Like, it was not us having brunch. And then we were having brunch together because I wanted to get to know these people and this story. And at the end, I even, I even decided to treat them to brunch. Uh, keep in mind, <laughs> it was free, so I, uh, I paid for their mimosas. But uh, these are your benefactors, the people that can get you backstage to Hamilton, right? <laughs> these, these are the rich neighbors that Jesus is talking about. They're the people that even if, you don't, even if you don't know anything about them, you want to get to know them because they have something that you want. And Jesus is saying, don't, don't invite these people, all four of these categories, right? Your friends, your family, your people, your benefactors, they can all kind of fall into this, this group of people that I'm going to call friends with benefits, Am I using that term properly, right? <laughs> they're, they're friends that somehow benefit you. If there is another definition, I don't know what it is, okay? Uh, so th- all of these people, Jesus says, they can benefit you. You, you will invite them to lunch, but they're going to invite you back, or they're going to do something, and you're going to get repaid for your hospitality. Jesus says, no, 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 don't invite them. So who are we to invite? And, and I think there's two categories of people we see in this passage that Jesus wants us to invite to dine with us. And the first are the people that Jesus told us to dine with. And that's marginalized people. He says, invite the poor and the, the crippled and the lame and, and the blind. And these were the marginalized people in Jesus' day. These people, most of them weren't even uh, allowed access into the temple which was the center of Jewish society. And so they were completely ostracized and they were lonely. Lonely people living in isolation. And Jesus is saying, no, invite invite these people. If you fast forward 2,000 years later, turns out we have marginalized people. And, And actually some of the people on Jesus' list are still marginalized today, the poor and the people who are, are dealing with chronic, severe illnesses or uh, ongoing disabilities in some way. And, and these people, in addition to dealing with their, their issues, their ailments, are often isolated. And they're overlooked by society. And they're kind of pushed to the margins, and they're lonely. It's one of the reasons why I love the Viscardi Center. I love what they do in this building, because they're actually seeking out 
children who are, are, are medically fragile, kids that are often pushed to the fringes of society and are saying, no, no, we want, we want to bring them together and we want to love them and we want to serve them and we want to care for them. And they do amazing work here. I love that we get to share our space with such an amazing organization. But these, these groups of people, they're often still today overlooked. But this isn't a comprehensive list of the marginalized people of society. It wasn't in Jesus' day, and it's, it's not in our day either. And so I want, I want your help a little bit with this. Who are the marginalized in our day? In addition to these people, who else would you consider marginalized and overlooked by our society? You can just shout it out. <sighs> we'll come back to them in a minute. Uh, yeah. The elderly, absolutely. It was one of the first that came to my mind. It was the first one mentioned in the last service. The elderly, especially, you know, in, I feel like here in New York where everything's just so fast-paced and everything, the elderly, they kind of get pushed out and we, you know, make them move to Florida or something. Uh, but no, uh, I, I, yeah, the elderly, absolutely. Who else? Homeless, yeah, absolutely. You know, you see somebody on the street and we might be eager to, like, give them some money or buy them a meal, but, but you think about the relationships that are missing from their life, the loneliness that they experience. So I'll hand back here. Yeah, the undocumented, the foreigner, the person who doesn't speak the language and doesn't know the cultural norms, who doesn't quite fit in and doesn't know how to, to get involved. There's such loneliness and isolation there. Who else? Yeah, people dealing with, with mental illness on, on a whole variety of levels uh, just feel so alone, feel so misunderstood. In the back there, there's... oh, that was your answer. <laughs> Any others that come to mind? What about in the church? Who gets marginalized in the church? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so here in our community, if we're not careful, we can, we can live in such a way. It's not that we're purposefully re rejecting, but we kind of overlook the people that might be searching or they might not be where we are in our, our faith walk. And, you know, they say that that three-minute greeting that we have here uh, on Sunday mornings, it is the loneliest three minutes of the service for the, the person, who, the guest who's here for the first time or the, the person who isn't involved in, in some other ways. And so they get kind of overlooked. Yeah. Who else? Anybody? I think one is, uh, is single adults. I think our society in general doesn't do a great job, and I think the church doesn't always do a great job with uh, caring for single adults and, you know, bringing them into community. And, uh, and we, we treat them as if, uh, you know, th their singleness is a problem, and it's not. And, and like, we, we just get twisted up in how we deal with these things. Uh, another one that I heard somebody brought up in between services uh, is, is the addict. Very often addicts, uh, they just get isolated because of their issues, and we don't know how to help them. And There's a lot of, of marginalized people in our lives, and Jesus is saying, invite these people. He says, they can't, they can't offer you anything in return, but that's not the point. That's not the point. But there's a second category of people and these are the people, not that Jesus told us to dine with, but it's the people Jesus modeled dining with. And that's toxic people. Remember, Jesus is at lunch with a prominent Pharisee who was watching, waiting with his friends to see Jesus mess up, right? And because this guy wasn't just a Pharisee, he was a prominent Pharisee, and there's, there's a good chance that this particular guy was even somehow involved in getting Jesus crucified. Like, talk about toxic people. Uh, and Jesus routinely, this isn't like an isolated occurrence, Jesus routinely ate with the Pharisees. Like, a lot of times we think about Jesus spending all this time with the marginalized, and he did, but he also made room for toxic people. Because toxic people are people too, right? Like, Oprah will tell you, Oprah will tell you, it is good for you to show hospitality to the marginalized people in this world. But... But only Jesus is going to say, make room for toxic people. Because there's a lot of conversation in our society about cutting off toxic people, putting up these walls, making sure they don't bring you down. And, and there is something about boundaries and, and, and all of that. I'm not completely discounting that. But at the same time, think about the, the effects of loneliness and isolation on people right, that we, we talked about to begin with. Now, you're going to take a toxic person who's already dealing with some issues, and you're going to put them out to pasture in isolation. Do you think that's going to deal with the toxicity? 
Of course not. It's only going to cause these things to get worse, right? Because marginalized people and toxic people, they're people who are feeling the effects of isolation. And who is it that is going to bring community to them? Because it, it, it's hard. It is. Uh, So one of the things I oversee in my role at Beacon is I oversee the small groups. And I can tell you that half of you are involved in small groups. So we're going to say this half. We're going to draw a line down the middle. Congratulations, you guys are now in small groups. And you guys are not. But there's no judgment. Don't worry. Uh, So, but I I talk to people all the time. And people who aren't in small groups very much want to be in small groups. Any guesses on what the number one reason is for people not joining a small group? Time right? It's so hard to find the time. All of us are so busy. This isn't something that's unique to people inside the church. You go outside of these walls, and everybody is struggling with the same thing. We don't have enough time. Most people, most adults, don't have enough time to invest relationally in the people that we like. (laughs) So who is going to step out and invest relationally in the people that are going to offer us nothing in return? Who's it going to be if it's not the church? Who's going to say, I'm going to take this this precious time and I'm going to invest it in somebody who can't give me anything in return? If it's not us, who's it going to be? Because there is a cost. That's the point of what Jesus is saying. There is a cost. He's acknowledging the cost. From the very beginning, he says that the friends who can benefit you, they, they repay the cost. Anytime you're investing in a relationship, there's a cost, right? There's the time. There's the money, all of that. And Jesus is saying, yes, there's a cost. There is. He acknowledges that. But he says that there is a reward. He says the reward is greater. That yes, there's a cost, but there's a repayment for engaging in this. And that reward is greater than what you're going to get from just investing into the people that you like and the people that like you and your, your people and your benefactors. He says there, there's a reward and it's, it's greater. Now, just to be clear, Jesus isn't saying you're not allowed to ever again have, like, dinner with your friends. He's not saying you have to cut off anybody who, like, you like. That's not his point. He's just saying that there's also another way that we can in- invest relationally into the lives of people who don't benefit us, and there is still a reward there, and that reward is greater, but that reward is future, And that's really important. He says that this reward will come at the resurrection of the righteous. And understanding that's a future reward is important because we did the whole Night to Shine thing a few weeks ago. Who was involved in Night to Shine? Yeah. Yeah. Can you just give these guys a hand because they did so much. All right. Now, talking to you guys involved in Night to Shine, there's like, what, what a better picture of what Jesus is talking about than Night to Shine, where we invite all of these guests who they probably don't have anything to pay us in return. We're doing this because we want to show them that we love them, right? Uh, and so who here, who was involved in Night to Shine, who had an awesome time? <laughs> who like walked away from that feeling like this was great? Who walked away saying, feeling like you were rewarded for you know, the time there, right? You, you, like, people even use this language. It's a very rewarding experience, and it was. But who here, uh, who served at Night to Shine, who of you has died and been raised again? Nobody? Oh, man, I thought maybe, no. Uh, Jesus says that the reward that he is talking about is, comes at the resurrection of the dead. So the reward that he's talking about is a future reward. As rewarding as night to shine is, that's not the reward he's talking about. And that's, that's important because there might be times where it's not that rewarding. Like, there might even be a couple of you who didn't have a good time at night to shine. Like, maybe you're, the guest that you were paired with was miserable the whole time and ungrateful. And, or, you know, maybe you dealt with an angry parent or something along those lines. Like, it, it is possible that even at night to shine that you didn't have an amazing experience. And, and if you think about it, if you're investing in uh, both marginalized and toxic people, it's not always going to go well. You're not going to walk away and be like, that was a worthwhile investment. Jesus is saying that's, that's true. But that's not your reward. Your reward is future. And your reward is certain. Your reward is certain because of who is promising the reward. It is Jesus who is promising the reward. And I I love that he ties it to the resurrection. Because I actually think he's drawing our attention, not just to our future resurrection, that hope, 
of reward, but he's also drawing us to his resurrection, that the hope of our reward in the future is made certain by his resurrection in the past. We can have a confidence in this. I, I love how one pastor says it. He says, if any man can predict, all right, predict his own death and resurrection and then pull it off, I'm going to go with what that guy says, <laughs> right? This is Jesus who went into it saying, hey guys, I'm going to die and don't worry, in three days I'm going to be raised to life. And then he did it, right? If anybody is trustworthy, it is Jesus. And he is making this promise that your reward is certain. And the question is, do you trust him? Do you trust him? Right? Because this is a faith step. Because you're going you're gonna to take that precious time that you have so little of, and you're going to invest it in somebody who might do nothing for you in return whether it's a marginalized per person who doesn't have anything to give you in return, or it's a toxic person who doesn't want to give you anything in return. You're going to take your precious time and give it to them. And it feels like this is risky, but, it, but it's not. Because of the Jesus who says, no, 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 there is a reward coming for you. And that reward, it is greater, it is future, and it is certain. I guarantee it. Jesus guarantees it. But I, I don't know about you. Sometimes I, I think of heavenly rewards and future hope and everything like that. These are great ideas, but it's hard for me to sink my teeth into them, right? Uh, you guys with me that sometimes you think of like, yeah, this hope of heaven, eternity with God, like it, it sounds great, but it also kind of sounds like far-fetched and it's hard to wrap my mind around. It. It's hard to like really grasp onto, right? But there, there's something else about this scenario is, it's that befriending the unloved prefigures our reward. So the very reward that Jesus is saying is our, our future hope, what we're doing is actually a, a prefiguring. It is a, a foretaste of that future hope. And, and just a, a chapter earlier in Luke chapter 13, Jesus talks about our future hope in a slightly different way. He says, People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first and first who will be last. And he's talking about this future hope. And he says, people are going to come from all over. And we're those people, all right? They're going to come from north and south and east and west. And we're going to take our seats at this banquet. Right? He uses the idea of sitting at the table at this party, this dinner party with him as our, our future hope. Where he is going to welcome us in and us who weren't his friends, he's going to call friend. And us who weren't his family, he's going to call brother. And us who weren't his people, he's going to call my people and he's going to make us rich. This is our, our future hope and it's so hard for that to be real to me at times. But then you take something like night to shine. And this, this is something that I can, I can actually sink my teeth into. This is something that I can understand. Because with Night to Shine, many of you, uh, you guys were working for months in advance, fundraising, so that these, these guests could come and be celebrated. When, and we don't have to pay a dime to be there, right? And then you had others who recognized that many of these guests, they don't have the, the proper clothes for an event like this. And so you donated your clothes to clothe them. And then others of you were there doing hair and makeup and shining shoes to make them presentable for this, this party, this banquet, just for them. And there were others of you who were there at the, the welcome gate and you were cheering them on and you were shouting and you were praising them as they were coming in, telling them that they're loved and they're welcomed and just celebrating them as they're coming in. And there were others of you who were there in advance and you set the table so that when those guests came in, they, there was a table ready for them. And there were others of you who were buddies and you hung out with these guests all night long. And at the end of the night, you took a crown and you placed that crown on their head and you said, you are loved. I love you and you matter, right? And you saw the smiles on these guests' faces. I mean, ear to ear, they just lit up. And then you looked and you saw the parents of these guests and they were welling with tears, overjoyed. This is our second year doing it. And, and for so many of these guests, they said this, they were looking forward to this all year because it was the best night of their year. This is the best thing that I, they experience. You see that joy, and that joy I can, I can latch onto. And then all of a sudden I read this, and I realize I'm the guest. In that future hope, I'm, I'm the guest. That Jesus is the one who went out, and he paid the price for me 
so that I could be welcomed in and I wouldn't have to pay a dime. And Jesus is the one who realized that in, in my sin and my filth, I, I was not dressed appropriately for this party. And he is the one who clothes me with righteousness. And he's the one who prepares me and, and makes me presentable. And then he's the one who welcomes me in with shouts of acclamation and praise and, and just songs of joy. And he's the one who has this table prepared for me to dine at. And he's the one who is going to be walking alongside of me all along this buddy to connect with me all night long. And he's the one who at the end is going to take this crown and crown me with glory and to tell me, you matter and you are so deeply loved. And I see, I see in what happened with these guests and I see the joy that they had and I realize that's my future hope and that when we take Jesus' word and we go out and we find the lonely, we find the hurting, we find the, the, the marginalized people and the toxic people and we choose to love them the way that Jesus loves us, that we're actually getting this glimpse of our future hope. We get this picture, just a taste of how sweet it is. Imagine if Night to Shine wasn't an event, but it was a, a, a lifestyle for our community. Imagine if this wasn't something we did once a year, but we were doing this constantly. We were seeing people in our community doing this constantly, and we were hearing stories, and we were doing it ourselves. Imagine the, the lonely people who would receive healing in community, but also imagine the hopefulness that would be stirring in us as we were getting to see this, this picture of our hope before us day in and day out as people were living out our hope, prefiguring the joy of the, the feast that we're going to share with Jesus. This is my challenge for you this week and, and ongoing. Take the time. Your time is precious. Take the time and invest it in the people that have nothing to give you in return. Engage them. Offer community. Be, be the person that they can come to so that we can see this become who we are. And it's not going to happen accidentally, right? You know this. It's not going to—your time gets filled up. To, you you got you to gotta figure out how you're going to do it. I set up reminders— uh, on my task list that show up uh, periodically just to remind me to reach out to certain people because I know they're not going to reach out to me. But figure out a way to carve out this time that you can invest it in people so that you can bring, you can bring community to the lonely and so that you can see your hope playing out before you, getting a taste of that more and more in your life. Because it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. Let me pray for you. Father, we are grateful to be a part of a community where, where people here, they, they love us and they care for us. People who are thinking about us and uh, investing in us. And God, it is, it is a joy to know that we're not alone, God, but we also think of those who are alone. We think of the people that are hurting and isolated, people who uh, are being pushed away and the people who are being overlooked. And we pray that you will comfort them, but we also pray that we will comfort them. That we would learn to be community. That we would learn to invest, God, not just in the temporal rewards that come from uh, friendship, but the future eternal rewards that come from bringing community to those who need it most. Father, we love you and we trust you in all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.